Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, September 6th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, no Hillary that wasn't a press conference. After making claims that she often talks to the media, Hillary Clinton abruptly ended her questions and answer session when she couldn't stop coughing. <coughs> Well, that doesn't sound too good. Meanwhile, the mainstream media and the Clinton campaign insist that Hillary's poor health condition is just a conspiracy theory. Then, uh, of course, the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? After claiming that the elections won't be rigged, Barack Obama now says the Russians may launch a covert operation to rig U.S. elections. And that means the DHS might be called in to monitor and assume direct control. All that plus more from Hacking Hillary. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. No, Hillary Clinton, that was not a press conference. After refusing to give an actual press conference for some 276 days, Hillary Clinton's campaign put together a little Q&A session with a gaggle of establishment reporters aboard her new private jet. Of course, it abruptly ended after about 10 minutes when she couldn't stop coughing. So she was asked a few softball questions, which gave her the perfect opportunity, which is what Hillary Clinton loves. She loves to be able to control the Q&A sessions. So they threw some softballs out of which she could throw out these crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, once again, she w made the claims that the Russian government is seeking to influence the U.S. election through cyber attacks and hacking. Immediately, she attempted to link Donald Trump to that alleged activity, saying, interesting that this activity happened around the time Trump became the nominee, raises even more serious questions about Trump. Mmm, she sounds like a conspiracy theorist. Where's your tinfoil hat, Hillary? Um, so then they, they also kind of went on to say, are you going to close Guantanamo Bay if you get elected, which that's an absurd question to ask her considering the scale of scandal that she is mired in. And not to mention that Obama is doing a really good job at clearing the place out of these potential jihadis. Uh, they also went on to uh, ask her one question of substance was asked uh, concerning her private email server. One of the reporters asked her about the claims that Hillary had her server wiped with a sophisticated program known as BleachBit, which, of course, then Clinton responded, I don't know anything about that. She claimed to be completely ignorant of it. That was not something I was aware of. And I think the fact uh, to point out that there was no connection, it wasn't something, as far as I understand, that was related. Oh, yeah, having your server wiped with bleach bit annihilating everything that was on your private server the issue with that is that this took place three weeks after she made that claim to the american people i've already told them to release my emails i want america to see what was on my server right and that's why you had one of your aides completely wipe it away with bleach bit and this is um, after she's made rep repeated claims that she turned over all of her work-related emails to the State Department, which we now find out that indeed she did not. There were thousands that she did not turn over. And, you know, they just let that go. She made that response to the question, and they didn't push her further on that. And that's why we have to be able to have these press conferences, actual press conferences, where she can't control the questions that are being lobbied at her, and so she needs to respond and continue to be pressed on this. And then here, uh, excruciating irony, they asked her about the conspiracy theories surrounding her health. She said, I'm not concerned about those conspiracy theories. I pay no attention to them. And that was just minutes before she had to stop the Q&A session because she could not stop coughing, hacking, okay? And just as, just as she did earlier in the day uh, there, Millie Weaver got that on Periscope her for about four minutes of, like, tremendous hacking. So we'll get to that later. But now, in spite of the Labor Day dump, we told you that this is this is what they do. Whenever there's a big holiday weekend, they put out more of the emails and more things related to Hillary Clinton because we see this collusion and cover-up from all angles. Well, now the Trump campaign is calling on the FBI to make the additional Clinton email investigation records public. 
Uh, the campaign manager says not only do the FBI interview notes underscore Hillary Clinton's terrible judgment, incompetence and dishonesty, they raise serious questions about whether emails regarding the terrorist attack in Benghazi were intentionally destroyed while under congressional subpoena. According to the FBI's notes, an intense round of deleting began weeks after lawmakers subpoenaed Clinton's emails following the New York Times report exposing her secret server. So they give you the key dates there. If you scroll down, you can see that on March 2nd of 2015, the New York Times reported on the existence of Clinton's private email system. Immediately following that report, the Benghazi committee subpoenaed emails from Clinton's private server. And then on March 9th, uh, Cheryl Mills sent over this preservation request. But on the 25th, so on the 25th, the company that's handling Clinton's private server, Platte River Networks, holds a conference call with Bill Clinton's staff. And then following that, sometime there, an aide wiped the server clean with bleach bit. That deleted all of her emails. So now, of course, the GOP is, is pursuing obstruction of justice. They're saying, was there some obstruction of justice there? Of course there was. We're seeing that repeatedly. And now some newly released emails suggest that a top Hillary Clinton aide actually staged managed the first hearing on the Benghazi terrorist attack. They were feeding specific topics that Clinton wanted to be addressed. Uh, they were feeding these specific topics to Democratic Senator Robert Menendez, who was at the time acting chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. The emails say, we wired it that Menendez would provide an opportunity to address two topics we needed to debunk, her actions and whereabouts on 9-11 and these emails from Chris Stevens about moving locations. And right out of the gate, these were the first hearing questions from Menendez that day. They covered both these topics, giving Clinton the opportunity to say where she was and how she handles these things. So even right there, we're seeing some collusion to make, you know, give her the opportunity to clear her name and make this look good, not to actually get to the bottom of things, but to feed her questions so she can give the response, just like with these Q&A sessions. And here also in this FBI emails, we've learned uh, that several of Hillary Clinton's aides told the FBI that they were unaware of the former Secretary of State's private email server. Uh, but a Daily Caller review of the public documents revealed that at least two of the aides, Huma Abedin and Cheryl Mills, were involved in multiple email exchanges in which Clinton's server was discussed. So there's no way that these top aides there at the State Department had no idea she was using this private server. Uh, more collusion, a DOJ official who led the independent Clinton email probe is actually in the big time donor to Obama. So this is someone who's supposed to be thoroughly independent. Uh, he's part of the government's investigation into her email practices. But, you know, he's contributing to President Obama's presidential campaign. That is David H. Lofman. So it's just the whole system is rigged. And this is even after President Obama says rigged. What does that even mean? Who would do that? So back to these Russian conspiracy theories. Um, now intelligence agencies are accusing Russia of conducting a broad covert operation in the U.S. to sow public distrust in the integrity of upcoming elections only weeks after the president suggested that this the elections would not be rigged who would he what does that even mean he said so these officials are now saying that russia is going to disrupt the election process directly and the fbi has alerted state and local officials to be prepared for potential cyber threats but clearly it's actually the white house that's pushing these conspiracy theories the intelligence official says they have no definitive proof of russia tampering with the coming elections and additionally, the Washington Post refers to the Russian government hack of the DNC, yet in the same sentence notes the hack has not been officially ascribed by the U.S. government to Russia. So they haven't officially blamed it on them, but they're going to go ahead and just put it out there in the public domain that indeed it is Russia and indeed they are trying to sow distrust when really, truly, it's the White House that is trying to sow distrust because they want they don't want to get into the contents of these leaks showing that it was actually top level uh, agents there within the DNC that were rigging the election. That's what we need to be concerned about. But instead, they're immediately shifting the blame to this concern of the boogeyman, Russia. And you got to feel sorry for um, Tim Kaine, who is Hillary Clinton's running mate there for VP. He's getting laughed at already because he is trying to uh, run interference saying, you know, Hillary Clinton, she talks to the press a lot. She's been very transparent with the press. 
But I, I, obviously he doesn't understand the difference between Hillary's staged events and a real, unscripted, open access press conference where reporters are going to be allowed to ask whatever they want. That's what Hillary is so afraid of. We've already seen the way she responds when the questions are lobbed at her. So he also went on to say, you know, she she made a mistake by only using one device. She used 13. Her her aides tried to destroy these 13 devices with actual hammers. They tried to break these. So then he goes on to say, well, Hillary wants the people to have access to the information. She wants it to be public, despite the whole hammers and deleting the emails thing with bleach bit. And of course, back to the hacking Hillary, the media was caught in a blatant lie trying to say that the pollen count was really high in the area that day. Oh, it's just allergy season. Hillary Clinton joked about being allergic to Donald Trump. And, you know, I guess they don't understand that there are websites that actually track the daily allergen level, which confirmed that grass pollen was low, tree pollen was low, ragweed pollen was moderate, allergens were not high. So, of course, it doesn't explain the exact same coughing fit that Hillary Clinton has had on multiple occasions. And as Trump's campaign manager says on Hillary's coughing, she must be allergic to the media. And that's what was getting her off. And now, get this, now that everyone's really digging in with what, what was actually going on with the pay to play there with Cl the Clinton Foundation, Hillary says that it is appropriate that Bill Clinton will cut ties with the foundation if she becomes the president. She's not going to comment just yet on Chelsea's involvement. She says, you know, we'll get there if I'm elected. But, you know, if it was wrong, if it's wrong, if she becomes the president for the Bill Clinton to have such close ties with the foundation, well, what was the deal with being secretary of state? Why was it okay then? We are spiraling headlong into what amounts to the final two months of the presidential race. But where is Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton? What difference at this point does it make? Days ago, Hillary Clinton had not held a press conference in 274 days. That's right. Hillary Clinton had not held a press conference in all of 2016, an election year, until this sham. Hillary, surrounding yourself with what amounts to the press corps over at Teen Beat doesn't amount to a press conference. Why has she been absent? It's obvious that Hillary's frail health can't deal with the monumental deviance that is her growing email scandal. More damning evidence came to light as the architect of the email cover-up, former Clinton Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills, clearly obstructed the FBI's investigation by deleting emails with .com addresses, only saving the emails with .gov or .mil. Eliminating all of Clinton's then Chief of Staff Uma Abedin's, Mills and other aides' correspondence between Clinton. Judicial Watch President also. Tom Litton said the FBI saw massive document destruction and clear intent to withhold material evidence. He added, and they just ignored that obstruction and even let her sit in on the interview. Correspondence between Clinton and Abedin, who regularly emailed her boss from Uma at ClintonEmail.com and H. Abedin at HillaryClinton.com, is crucial, Fitton said, because Abedin acted as the go-between on requests for access to Clinton from shady foreign Clinton Foundation donors. He says the mushrooming pay-for-play scandal is the real reason the former Secretary of State set up a private email system in the first place. The whole thing was designed to keep Clinton Foundation emails from investigators, he said. Meanwhile, as Donald Trump becomes increasingly presidential, reaching out to the Mexican people, the flood victims in Louisiana, and the forgotten manufacturing corpse of Detroit, Hillary is elsewhere, preferring to rub elbows with those she is truly comfortable with and serving, the ultra-rich. Trump wants to cut taxes for the super-rich. Well, we're not going there, my friends. I'm telling you right now, we're going to write fairer rules for the middle class and we are going to raise taxes on the middle class. Hillary has been jet-setting from one elitist fundraiser after another and is taking pre-written questions from children to the tune of $2,700 apiece. You become president, what is your plan to connect mental health problems and guns to make sure that me, my brothers, and my friends are safe from violence at school? I think we need to pass some laws that I have been advocating for 
We need comprehensive background checks. We need to close the gun show loophole, close the online loophole. But the gun lobby lives off of fear and misinformation. Open Secrets reveals Trump has raised $127.6 million, 2% of that coming from super PACs and 98% from campaign donations. While Hillary has raised $435.3 million, 28% from super PACs and 72% from donations. Hillary is clearly the Wall Street candidate and is propped up by a corporatocracy that has infested our republic. Meanwhile, the dying mainstream media continues to whitewash her poor health, absence from duty, and her own bungling of the issues. Her popularity ratings are sinking right now, and I'm not sure they're sinking because she's campaigning too little or too ineffectively, or because she's campaigning too much. I sort of suspect the latter, and that she'd do better if she was even quieter than she is now. And the media continues to fall on its sword, going with the narrative of total propaganda, as was in the case of the Huffington Post article titled, Conspiracy Theorist Alex Jones Boasts About Advising Donald Trump. Editors note, Donald Trump regularly incites political violence and is a serial liar, rampant xenophobe, racist, misogynist, and birther who has repeatedly pledged to ban all Muslims, 1.6 billion members of an entire religion, from entering the United States. This is what we can expect from a completely propagandized media as it protects the globalist choice and possibly sickest candidate since William Henry Harrison in an attempt to enter the Oval Office. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm running for president. Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. I'm hitting the road to earn your vote, and I hope you'll join me on this journey. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, President Barack Obama has been considered one of the most disrespected presidents of all time. And a lot of people say it's because he's a black man. Eh, you know, I, I'm not going for that. I think it's because he is a failed president. Obamacare, a failure. The fact that he can't even go and visit with the people in a timely manner in Louisiana. Instead, he's too busy playing golf. Meanwhile, Donald Trump goes down there and gets the job done quickly and he gets it done actually by handing out stuff, helping out the people, showing that he cares. President Barack Obama this weekend actually went to Laos late Monday night to become the first U.S. president ever to visit a Southeast Asian country. He encountered more than his usual share of friction and confrontation on his 10th trip to the region. It started with his arrival at the airport in China, where Chinese officials failed to provide Obama with a staircase to disembark from the upper door of Air Force One down onto a red carpet. Instead, he had to use an alternative exit on Air Force One, which is located on the bottom of the plane, and many saw it as a deliberate sign of dis disrespect by the Chinese. And who do you think is going to chime in on this situation? Donald Trump. Donald Trump tweeted out this weekend, China wouldn't provide a red carpet stairway from Air Force One, and then Philippines president calls Obama the son of a whore. Terrible. Another tweet. Can you believe that the Chinese would not give Obama the proper stairway to get off his plane? Donald Trump also said that he would have refused to meet with the Chinese officials if they treated him like they treated Mr. Obama. Donald Trump then said, if that were me, I'd say, you know what, folks, I respect you a lot. Let's close these doors. Let's get out of here. Mr. Obama downplayed the episode like he always does and pretty much blew it off like nothing happened at all. Also, there were running verbal battles between Chinese and U.S. officials and U.S. journalists at the G20 summit. A Chinese official tried to block White House National Security Advisor Susan E. Rice from moving closer to Mr. Obama at the airport, forcing a Secret Service agent to intervene. Now this leads me to another article by the New York Post. This is our country. Tempers flare as Obama arrives in China. On the tarmac, a quarrel broke out between the presidential aide and a Chinese official who demanded the journalist traveling with Obama be prohibited from getting anywhere near him. It was a breach of the tradition observed whenever the American president arrives in a foreign place. When the White House official insisted the U.S. would set the rules for its own leader, 
her Chinese counterpart shot back, this is our country, this is our airport, the Chinese official yelled. So you can see simply that people do not have respect for America like they used to. And that's what we need, a true leader. That's why the populace is Donald Trump. That's why people are standing in line for hours and hours upon the thousands to go listen to this man speak because we're tired of having a president that is disrespected by countries all over the world. That is not going to happen under Donald Trump. Before leaving China, Mr. Obama held what's likely to be his final meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has bedeviled Mr. Obama virtually since day one. They talked about a ceasefire in Syria, where Russia supports the regime of President Bashar al-Assad, but reached no conclusion. Then they discussed Russia's aggression in Ukraine, but reached no conclusion. And yet again, Mr. Trump fires back with another tweet, giving his opinion on about what he thinks took place. President Obama and Putin fail to reach deal on Syria. Obama is not a natural deal maker. He only makes bad deals. Amid all the friction, Mr. Obama did make progress on one of his prime legacy goals, formally entering the U.S. with China into the Paris Climate Change Agreement to reduce carbon emissions globally. In Laos, Mr. Obama was to hold his first meeting with new Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, but the White House canceled it after the Philippine leader called Mr. Obama a son of a bitch on Monday. You must be disrespectful, Mr. Duterte said of Mr. Obama. Do not just throw away questions and statements, son of a bitch. I will curse you in that form. We will be wallowing in the mud like pigs if you do that to me. As you can see, President Barack Obama is not respected by many foreign leaders. It's time to get someone in the White House who will be respected, someone who's going to work for the American people, someone who's going to listen to the American people, and someone who's finally going to straighten this country up. Stay tuned for more reports at InfoWars.com. I'm Joe Biggs. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump is now surging in the polls, and he has just received what might be his strongest endorsement yet. In an open letter from the military leaders, 88 former military leaders have just voiced their public support for Donald Trump. The strong statement reads, the 2016 election affords the American people an urgently needed opportunity to make a long overdue course correction in our national security posture and policy. As retired senior leaders of America's military, we believe that such a change can only be made by someone who has not been deeply involved with and substantially responsible for the hollowing out of our military and the burgeoning threats facing our country around the world. For this reason, we support Donald Trump's candidacy to be our next commander-in-chief. Not only are these strong words of support for Donald Trump, this is actually also a knock on Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, who are responsible for the unrest in the Middle East and the purging of the military. The statement goes on. In our professional judgment, the combined effect is potentially extremely perilous. That is especially the case if our government persists in the practices and people that have brought us to this present pass. For this reason, we support Donald Trump and his commitment to rebuild our military, to secure our borders, to defeat our Islamic supremacist adversaries, and restore law and order domestically. We urge our fellow Americans to do the same. Now, this is the same message that Donald Trump and Mike Flynn encouraged in Virginia today, asking people to get their family and friends to get out to the polls and vote Donald Trump. Is this Donald Trump's greatest endorsement yet? This shows that Donald Trump is not alone. He has support from the military in his efforts and in his foreign policy. Now, Remo Butler, a retired Brigadier General, went on Fox and CNN today voicing his support for Trump, but he also took the conversation in a different direction. Uh, it was a big decision point to come on CNN and do this. And I especially do appreciate your being as here. A, especially mm -hmm. as, a, as a black man. Why is that? The media sets the tone. If you watch the media and you watch TV, you would think that all black people are on welfare. We live in the ghetto. We get, we're so afraid of getting shot, and we wear our hair in dreadlocks. So to me, 
That means that Remo Butler is not just supporting Donald Trump as a former member of the military, but also as a black American citizen who is sick and tired of the mainstream media determining how the black voter should feel. Now, is this Trump's greatest endorsement? Are we going to see the military and black people in America coming out for support of Donald Trump? Right now, the polls are showing it. CNN and Fox both had to admit today that Donald Trump now leads Hillary Clinton in the polls. Of course, the Washington Post is still running with the false narrative that Hillary Clinton has the lead over Donald Trump. For more coverage on the 2016 election, visit Infowars.com. Um... The Federal Reserve is a private banking cartel. The yeah, Fed is a sometimes very independent uh, organization. What should be the proper relationship between the chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? The Federal Reserve is an independent agency. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. They print our money and then loan it to us at interest. The IRS is their collection agency. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Jeff Duncan says he saw IRS special agents using semi-automatic rifles at a gun range. Now he wants answers to why the agency needs that type of firepower. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world? The central bankers in charge. Know your history and you will know your enemy. Infowars.com I'm not gonna sit here and take it anymore. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Conservative icon Phyllis Schlafly dead at 92. She is and was an icon of human liberty, said Alex Jones. Without trailblazers like her, we would have no chance against the forces of tyranny. Schlafly, a formidable pro-family grassroots organizer who was politically active for 70 years, founded the Conservative Eagle Forum in 1972 and served as president since then, overseeing the organization's rise to 80,000 members today. Her focus from her earliest days until her final ones was protecting the family, which she understood as the building block of life. The Eagle Forum said in a statement she recognized America as the greatest political embodiment of those values. From military superiority and defense to immigration and trade, from unborn life to the nuclear family and parenthood, Phyllis Schlafly was a courageous and articulate voice for common sense and traditional values. You can find more reports like this at InfoWars.com. Well, with everyone getting back to school, you probably feel that exciting energy in the air. Ah, time to expand your cultural horizons, meet new people that you might not ever have been friends with. But no, in today's age, now it's all about compartmentalization, putting people in their special little groups, not allowing any sort of commingling with anyone that might trigger you or offend you. Ashley Beckford joins me now so we can talk a little bit about this. It's yes. not about equality anymore and everyone kind of joining together. It's all about superiority and the superiority of your special little victim class. That's exactly right, Leanne. What it's all about today is a culture of victimization. It's no longer, you know, we're all trying to understand each other and kind of get into our, um, you know, cohesive group. Like what brings us to this city if we're in a particular college or what what have you what brings us to you know this university it's all about let's get into our culture of victimization let's see how many points we have on the victim scale and let's see you know well what also it's racist and you yes. might trigger someone if you ask them exactly. where they're from because you know then you're insinuating that they're not from the united states right that's racist yes, so you, that's you can't even it. have conversations with people microaggressions are the big thing <laughs> that we're going to talk about today yeah. it's happening all over the the country and really the world. Right. And so yeah. one of the big stories out right now is that uh, California State University in, in Los Angeles, they just rolled out segregated housing for black students. So this is an arrangement. It comes just about nine months after the university's black student union issued a set of demands in response to what its members contend are frequent racist attacks on campus, such as racially insensitive remarks and microaggressions by professors and students. 
And so now, rather than having students get to know each other, get, you know, get to co-mingle with people they might never have become friends with, exactly. never have struck up conversations with, they want to provide a safe space where they can connect and learn from each other. Which so is just ridiculous just, because it's like you have no safe space. In the real world, you actually have right. to be out there interacting <laughs> with people of all different types of, you know, ethnic backgrounds, all different types of socioeconomic backgrounds. And I don't agree with the sociology, uh, you know, the social, uh, the socialist ideology that says that basically everything is class struggle, everything is oppression. So you need to see oppression in every single moment of your life. That's basically what it's about. Exactly, and this is not a historically black college. So why are you now segregating a university? It's if it's you want it to be segregated, time. go to a historically black college if that's the kind of experience that you seek. Right. But now because of these demands, they're completely rearranging the way that students are learning. And now, rather than uh, with this freshman orientation, where they would normally talk that talk them through Ice tutorials cream, on campus technology, <laughs> give them advice right. on how to choose classes, now it's all about these identity politics and training them not to commit any offensive microaggressions. That's any exactly right. Insults. They want to get them when they're really young. They want to get them when they first get in there. And instead of t teaching them about how to interact, uh, you know, cross culturally, which is typically what you would learn, they're actually teaching them how to segregate themselves into these little cliques. And it basically takes away from that whole idea of diversity. It's really the exact opposite. I am just so thankful that I graduated before I would have had to take this freshman orientation exactly, against right. uh, safe, spa safe spaces, trigger warnings. It's the whole new campus vocabulary on subtle microaggressions. Just about everything you do could be considered a subtle microaggression. So right. what is that? These are comments, snubs, or insults that communicate derogatory or negative messages. It might not be intended to cause harm, but they're targeted at people based on their membership in a right. marginalized group. Just simple things uh, they talk about actually here. They keep creating new terms to uh, describe the oppression that uh, they're going through. And one of them is environmental microaggressions, environmental microaggressions. You <laughs> enter the chemistry building, they're taking it into the STEM courses now too. And you see all the pictures are of males. So if you're a female like me or Leanne, you're going to feel that you're not welcome, you're not represented. That's ridiculous. It just so happens that a lot of the scientific, you know, developments have been created through white males. Uh, and then, and then you have micro invalidation. They're saying that uh, just merely suggesting that your race or your ethnic background actually uh, did not play that great of a role in uh, planning out your life. That's a micro invalidation. That's saying you know you're not able to. Uh, Everyone can succeed in this society if they work hard enough. <laughs> That's racist. That's racist, exactly. Well, That's a microaggression. And here we're actually starting to see some of these, um, seeing this sort of playing out. People are actually losing their jobs wow. if they commit these microaggressions or they don't issue a trigger warning before they post on a Facebook page. So here there was a 16-year special education teacher in St. Paul, Minnesota, Theo Olson. Um, he officially retired after coming to an agreement with the he district. He was forced out, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was forced out because he noted on a local Black Lives Matter organizer's uh, Facebook page that, among other things, students won't quit gaming, setting up fights, and selling drugs. So because he says this and he's like, hey, guys, you know, let's try to clean up what's actually the problem here, exactly. what's going on, they dubbed One him a white schools. supremacist teacher. And there's no coming back from that. And they that. forced them to go through uh, sensitivity training. They forced <laughs> them to go through equity training, they right. call it. Everything's equal. Everything's loving, you know, like Harrison Bergeron or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the island. Well, and God forbid <laughs> the school district tries to actually do something about <clears throat> what this teacher is complaining about. The fights, mm -hmm. the gaming, the selling drugs, which, right. I mean, I know growing up, I oh, saw yeah. that kind of going on in my school. So I can't even imagine how it is now. And exactly. if you even dare say anything about that, I mean, you're trying to create a safe environment for the other students that are there wanting to learn. Exactly. It's, but it's you're very, racist. it's, it's almost impossible to be a teacher nowadays. There's so many people, great teachers quitting the profession because of what's going on in the schools right now. Mm -hmm.
And so. now we've actually seen, I know David Knight uh, spoke a little mm -hmm. bit more on this about where this is really coming from. Right. Uh, but, you know, we see the government spending $500,000 fighting online trolls. The nanny state. Well, and the issue here is like people, they get online, they're so oppressed here in their speech in the universities and mm -hmm. school and in their daily lives that they get online and they have this sort of sense of anonymity. Exactly. So that they're going to say whatever they might they might never say to your face, but they're, they're going to say take, it online. They're going to take that away even from people. They're going right. to take that away where you can't even, you know, uh, communicate because they're going to have the Internet ideas. We know October 1st, ICANN is being transferred to the U.N. here. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's only going to get worse from here on out. <laughs> and, that's, and that's kind <laughs> of the thing is they're indoctrinating the students while they've got them right. there in the schools because this is the new the new reality that people are going to be living in. And you can see it here unfolding with this election, this mm -hmm. current election season. It's all about identity politics yeah. when it's like it doesn't matter what special group you belong to when we're all getting screwed, when exactly. everyone's out of a job. It doesn't matter who you are, how victimized you are. We're all getting victimized now and, and they don't want us to realize censored that. Unless you agree with the progressive politics. If you don't agree with the progressive politics, then you're definitely getting censored. You're definitely your speech means nothing, basically. Right. And just to just to kind of close this up with, mm -hmm. you know, how these <laughs> groups are working to become some of the most hated groups out there. Uh, Black Lives Matter activists actually shut down the London City Airport. Uh, flights were de de delayed. Nine protesters locked themselves together right there on the runway, posted pictures of it. Seven people have been arrested so far. But get this. This is a they terrorist did this. <laughs> they this did this because they say the climate crisis is a racist crisis. Cut emissions. So this is what this group, you know, you can't be all things to all people. And right. now this is what happens when you take that money from George Soros. Now you've got to fight the fight of climate change and, and the, you know, this and that. It's like you can't be all things to all people. <laughs> but, you know, you're going to lock, lock arms there on the runway, <laughs> shut down the flights for climate change because Black Lives Matter. I don't, I'm, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's terrorism. <laughs> Well, the feds are about to spend a half million dollars to protect us from online trolls. It sounds like a great deal, doesn't it? But actually what it is is an example of the government again creating a problem and then offering a solution. A solution that destroys our freedom. In this case, the last bastion of free speech, the Internet. They'll do it by not protecting us from trolls, but by creating a de facto fingerprint. Now, you wouldn't go to the federal government for permission to use the Internet, would you? Most people would balk at that. If the government at some point came out and said, you're going to have to register with Homeland Security and we're going to give you an ID that you'll use everywhere on the Internet. Most people would say, no, thanks. Not going to do that. They would rebel against it. But what they're going to do in the name of protecting us from trolls is to create a de facto fingerprint without your knowledge, without your permission. How is this going to work? Well, quite frankly, it is a tale that includes CISA or CISPA or SOPA or ACTA or PIPA. Remember all of those uh, different efforts to allow corporations to turn over our information to the government without us being allowed to sue them for violation of privacy or for terms of agreement. They finally got it through with CISA. They told us that they needed it to protect us from, you know, foreign aggressors, not from the federal government. And this is where they've been headed all along. Let's look at how this is going to break down. Of course, this is an article that was uh, put out by the Daily Caller pointing to a couple of grants that have come out. And, of course, they say that this uh, work is going to help to combat troll armies that are being used by Russia and China. They point out in the article, and this is what has been sold to us by the people who are pushing through this half-million-dollar grant for these people. They say that uh, Russia's troll army is a government-sponsored, paid group of people who are out there to push an opinion with blog on blogs and on the Internet, on YouTube. Of course, we know the same thing is being done by the Chinese Snowden told us that it was being done by the UK. And of course, we know that it is being done by the American government. You can see it if you go to the comments section on YouTube for InfoWars videos, uh, for InfoWars articles. We know that this is happening. Now, what they're telling us is that this is something that is going to protect us. They say that it's, they define, and here's the key, they define trolls as people who have inauthentic, biased, misleading comments that are effective. So they have to protect us from that. And so what we understand, and this is something that Aaron Schwartz warned us about before he was, I believe, killed, not committed suicide. He said, look, they're pushing CISPA and all these different uh, aspects to take over the Internet to protect us from exploits that the government itself 
is creating. And he talked, gave examples of that. This is precisely what they're doing. They create the online trolls and massive armies of trolls and then say, we're going to have to take your freedom. And again, today we have Obama saying, we're not going to allow the Internet to be like the wild, wild west. As they say, they've got to protect us from these exploits. One of the things that they offer to us is Stutznet. That was something that was created by the U.S. and Israeli intelligence to destroy the centrifuges inside Iran's nuclear uh, reactors, uh, their projects where they were trying to create nuclear weapons. What happened with that? Well, in response to that, as they were successful in doing that, the Iranians then realized that they had to do something to respond. So what they did was they created an army, the fourth largest cyber army in the world. That's the way this always blows back. What we have now is an arms race on the military side, but on the civilian side, understand that all of this information, as they say in this grant, this half million dollar grant, this information is taken from you. They continually change the terms of uh, use, and people sign up for that, not knowing what they're doing. They're going to take that very data. They're going to use it to create a profile, just as geospatial intelligence uses your activity-based intelligence to create a profile of you. That's the way they're going to destroy our freedom, and they're going to do it in the name of protecting us from trolls. That's the way they always do it. <laughs> Leaked documents from George Soros' Open Society Foundation continue to reveal the extent to which the group influenced the political response there to Europe's refugee crisis. Now joining me is Margaret Howell. Uh, let's go ahead and break this down. Uh, so basically, to the tune of about $600,000, they are pushing this pro-refugee agenda. That's right. So they're trying to counter xenophobia, uh, xenophobic attitudes in Europe. Um, and he's doing more than than doing this mainstream, uh, polite push to try to normalize the refugee climate that we're in. He's bullying and censoring what he can't normalize in the collective psyche. And 600,000 in lobbying efforts and uh, wanting to make the religion of peace uh, us be more tolerant to mm -hmm. it. The same religion of peace. Uh, he doesn't say, though, whether he's trying to normalize tolerance within the religion of peace, which is right. very uh, astonishing to me because we're talking about the same religion of peace that, uh, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos coined a peace last week called the London We Lost and how he talked about as a gay man, he doesn't really feel safe walking around his own hometown any longer because he knows that uh, how they feel about him right. and uh, throwing them off buildings and hanging them from cranes is, is what he cited. So the tolerance message only goes towards one side, unfortunately, with this massive lobbying push. Right, and so what about spending money to educate these people that are coming to the West? You know, mm -hmm. here's, here's, here's the assimilation effort. Welcome right. to the West, you're gonna love it here, but here's how we do things. Not, hey, by the way, why don't you go ahead and beat up women who are in their right. sunbathing in the park in France. Exactly, so the countering the anti-migrant rhetoric and toxic narrative surrounding migration in Europe, to be exact, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, well, it means <laughs> threatening people with prison if right. they dare uh, offend them on Facebook, like Angela Merkel has as well. And, uh, you know, we see this. This is just kind of the name of the game here with George Soros. He's got his hands in everything, his group, because they are fomenting unrest because they want to destabilize the planet. Mm -hmm. they, that's the only way they're going to be able to bring in this uh, one world government. Right. You have to destabilize. You've got to create the problem. And they're right there to provide the solution. I thought it was very interesting that there was an article uh, today about some illegal immigrants that were caught there at the border, and they're basically telling the Border Patrol, Obama told us to come. Correct. So we're talking about uh, border agents that capture um, people illegally trying to cross the southern border. And uh, these agents, they, they capture them, they immediately release them nine out of ten times, Leanne. So mm -hmm. they're free to either redo it, um, you know, and oftentimes we see that they do. And this happened in a sanctuary city, of course, not like San Francisco in terms of being a sanctuary city, but San Diego is right up there. And they said, Said, look, Obama said we can come. It's okay. Uh, yeah. We've got us okay. That's they didn't the say that's the president. They, they said specifically Obama. Right, exactly. You know, that this is the message they're getting is that Obama said it's okay. Um, and, you know, this is what's happening in these refugee countries as well. All they got to do is, is claim political asylum mm -hmm. and they can come right in. And so they don't want to go to the countries that will actually take them. Like I know Portugal is saying, hey, come on in, we'll mm -hmm. take you. And they don't want to go there. It's, they want to go where the handouts are. Right. We have Just such, like coming into the U.S. We have such a massive uh, program in place. So it, for the, the refugees that uh, the State Department has rubber stamped in, you won't believe the benefit package. The, the visa application process is so streamlined. It's basically like, hello, you're in. Oh, by the way, here's a house. 
here's our education, here's food, indefinitely, have as many children as you'd like, right. we've got you. We know we promised that we would cure the homeless veteran population, that that was one of Obama's pledges. Mm -hmm. That that hasn't happened, but he's going to fast track people who are going the illegal route to come through here. I, not the, not rewarding the people who have been patiently waiting, trying to abide by the laws of coming to this country legally mm -hmm. and going through the rigmarole of the whole visa process. And Ron Paul has an article up at Infowars.com, how to solve the illegal immigration problem. He doesn't want walls. He doesn't want government databases, no biometric national ID cards. How to solve it? Not a penny in welfare for illegal immigrants. It's really that simple. Don't yeah. reward people. I mean, I love Dr. Paul. I agree with him on so much. I have such a deep respect for him. But in this case, Leanne, you know, he's, he's all about small government, and I am as well. But isn't it the job of the federal government to secure the border? And that's what he attacks. He's like, okay, well, if you build a wall eight feet high, you're going to find somebody with a ladder that, that's nine feet long. So he, he makes a good point. But at the same time, the most basic job of the federal government is to secure the border. Well, and that's very true. And, I, and as we saw in that report, um, with Joe Biggs as well, the wall, you know, it's more like a fence. It's, you know, there are barriers that are being uh, penetrated, if you will, all <laughs> over the border there. So it, it, and it and also, too, if you construct the wall, it's going to keep us in as well. So, you know, I feel like they've definitely got their hands tied, but you would definitely curve the influx of these people if they knew they weren't going to get these handouts and get kind of fast tracked in. Just like you said, you know, here's a house. Here's all the benefits. Here's your food stamps. Uh, like this other family that's here, this one just made me so angry. This was a New York deli owner, and they were charged with food stamps fraud, and they actually broke in and, and committed a bunch of robberies, uh, stealing kitchen cabinets, hot water tanks, and heating uh, units from an unoccupied rental property. And when they get she has charged, her up. she's Look like, this. F you, America. Are you happy now? Now we have to pay for the crimes you committed. Screw you. Oh, well, thank you, Margaret. Be sure to join us here tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Central, for our live coverage of the Commander-in-Chief Forum.